campfire. Now, many of us, we don't have campfires every day. Some of you might. We don't, we don't have campfires every day. But think about it. Most all of us have sat around one before. Usually they're at night. That's the best time for a campfire. And if you break that down to what's going on there, you've got a campfire. You've got a fire. You've got light. You've got warmth. And it seems to draw people in, right? You all with me? And you think about what else goes on around a campfire. I mean, I mean, even, even when you're sitting at a campfire by yourself, and sometimes I sit out at the fire pit by myself. I've done that before. Even when you're out there by yourself, but usually if you're with a group of people, you're around the campfire. And what's going on? Well, there's light, and there's warmth, and there's heat, and there's sharing, and there's connection, and there's conversation. You all still with me? Many, many times there's food, right? If nothing else, you have s'mores around the campfire. Or you have gross marshmallows. Yeah, I kind of like marshmallows. Okay? Campfires. Most all of us get them. Here's, here's why I open with this idea of a campfire. It's that reminder that just as I tell the children and tell them every time we baptize babies, the repetition of the water, it's a reminder to all of us as adults that God has always used and God continues to use simple, common, everyday things that we know about to teach us things that we don't know about. God has always used common, simple, everyday things that we know about that we understand to teach us about how God is and how God works. God uses things that we understand because God knows we need more God. God knows we need more of God. So God has picked simple things to help us understand that. Things like fire and bread. That's why we have it down front here. That's why we have extra candles today. Next week and the week after, it's fire and it's bread. It's two things that we absolutely positively know about. We know about fire. We know about bonfires. We know about cooking fires. We know about, in some of your, some of your homes, you know about pilot lights and a gas furnace, right? I mean, for some of you that have actually broken down and turned your furnace on, I think you're weak, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> if you like it 70, 65 degrees in the summertime, what's the problem with having your house at 65 degrees in the wintertime? At least that's my argument. I haven't won it yet, but anyway. I can write this. I was looking for Chris. He's out of here, but yeah, we've had this uh, argument this week. Well, uh, we haven't. Kim has. Kim, his wife, thinks that you need to have the furnace on. I don't understand that. But anyway, you know about it is the point. You know about fire. You know about there's this little tiny spark of fire that happens in your car, and if it didn't happen in your car, in your car you wouldn't be here unless you walked. And I don't think anybody walked to church today, did they? So see, we know about fire. We know about bread. We know about flour and yeast and water and salt. In case we don't know about it, it's right there in front of you that uh, Fran uh, Hedeman and Sue Miller put together uh, as part of our worship dream team, a new reconstituted team that's working with me uh, every week for an hour and a half every Wednesday to dream this stuff up. But you know about bread. You know about daily bread. We do. We know about bread, whether it's French bread or Wonder Bread or rye bread. We get it. I think you get it. Throughout the Bible and throughout history, God has used and still uses fire and bread, two familiar things to teach us about the presence and necessity of God. And just in case you won't take my word for it, quickly remember that, that there, was a, there was a burning bush that got this whole movement started, right? It was a bush that didn't start, it was fire. God's presence known in fire. And then you had the pillar of fire that led the Israelites out of, out of, the, uh, out of the desert. Then you had bread. In the New Testament, in the Gospels, specifically, Jesus talked about bread a lot. We just read that. I am the bread of life. We know that during communion, which we'll celebrate next week, there was bread. Jesus said, this is my body. At the end of the Gospels, it says that two of his followers, who were very discouraged, didn't recognize Jesus in their midst, but they sat down and he was recognized in the breaking of what? Bread. Bread. Bread and fire in the uh, epistles and when this movement got started, it was on Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came and God's presence and God's activity was signified by what? Fire. Fire and bread. It's no accident. It is no accident that not only does God use things we know about, but here's the important thing today. God uses fire and bread to remind us and teach us about how much we need God because fire and bread are vital for living. 
You all agree with that? Say yes. yes. We need fire and we need bread. It's vital. Vital. You're going to hear that word a lot because it's a huge word. And in case you don't know it and don't get it, vital means essential. Absolutely necessary. Full of energy and life. Lively. That's vital. God picked fire and bread to remind us about how much we need God because we need fire and we need bread. Fire and bread. We're familiar with them, you know? Vital. Vital. We know about vital organs. If we don't have those things, we die, right? Your heart, your lungs, your skin. How many of you knew your skin was an organ? It is. If you don't have skin, you're in trouble. You know, if you have no skin, kidneys, liver, brain. The same way God is saying, a relationship with me is vital. It is vital. It will bring you life. If you don't have a relationship with me, says God, your life will be different. So that brings us to our first question that I ask each one of you very seriously. Do you have a vital relationship with God? Let me rephrase that. Do you, you, consider God vital to your life? Do you consider God vital to your life? Here's the definition. Do you consider God vital to your life? And I mean besides, besides when you're in trouble. Besides when you're in the emergency room. Besides when you are in the funeral director's office making plans. Do you consider God vital to your life? That's my question. It's not a complicated question. Do you consider God vital in your life besides the times when you've messed up so badly, nobody will talk to you. Or you can't look yourself in the eye in the mirror and you can't meet the eye of anyone else. Besides those times, do you consider God vital to your life? Do you consider God vital, essential, necessary? Part of your life between the benediction and the next praise song the following Sunday. That's the time period I'm talking about, right? And that's the question I give to you, vital. If God's a source of life, is God a source? Do you, if you miss your God time, do you feel uh, incomplete? Do you feel listless? Do you feel disorganized? Because that's the opposite of vital. The opposite of vital is inconsequential. The opposite of vital is dying and death. Not important, irrelevant. Vital. So I'm giving that to you to think about today and this week. Do you consider God vital to your life? Do you have a relationship with God? Now move another, another step over. What about your other relationships? What about your other relationships? Are they vital? Are they vital? Okay? And see, I think a lot of things, a lot of things that's going on here with this message, I realize, is that for many of us, especially those of us who've grown up in the church or who have been in the church a long time, I think we assume a lot of this stuff. We assume that we have a vital relationship with God just because we were born into a United Methodist family or Catholic family or Lutheran family and our name's in a membership book somewhere because we went through confirmation. And I say, I don't think so. And I'll get to more of that a little bit later, but this is a serious question. Do you have a vital relationship with God? Is it essential? Is it essential? More of God, less of you. What about your other relationships? You know, switch gears. Do you have relationships in your life that are life-giving or life-taking? That's a serious question. That's a serious question because it makes you examine yourself or at the very least examine the kind of people you're hanging out with. What about your relationships? Again, it's fire and bread. Do you have fire and bread relationships in your life? And if not, why not? Do you have relationships that are like fire. You know, fire keeps us warm, fire cooks our food, we read from fire, we gather around fire, whether it's a bonfire or electric lights, we worship with fire, we, we use it to read and get smarter. Bread nourishes us, sustains us, we, we share bread, we gather around bread, you know. Today, maybe some of you are gonna do that. It's bread, it's bread that draws you together. Do you have fire and bread relationships? That's my question. And if not, why not? Are your relationships life-giving and life-sustaining? Are they essential or are they life-sucking from you? That's the question. And when I think about this, I think this is a true statement. 
I think it's true that each and every one of us in this room, we long for fire and bread relationships. Really. That we really do. We, we desire fire and bread relationships. Relationships that, that are essential. Relationships that sustain us. Relationships that are fire, that are bread, that, that get us energized, that give us hope and all of that. We, we desire that. And I'm not going to make you stand up or raise your hand or any of that kind of thing, but think about it. Don't you really want a vital friendship with someone else? Don't you really want your marriage to be vital in all the things I've talked about? Fire and bread, sustaining, essential, life-giving. Do you want your marriage to be vital? Do you want your relationships with your children to be vital? Do you want your children to say that your relationship with them is vital? Do you want your relationship with your parents, with, with your extended family? And what about this? Don't you long for to have a vital, essential, life-giving relationship with your church family? And of course that brings us back to, don't you long for, don't you desire to have a vital relationship with God through Jesus Christ? Again, I say that just like the Israelite story is our story. It's a story of people who were in slavery. The people who were, who were in slavery, and they kept losing their way, they kept getting mad, and they were grumbling. They were a pretty miserable bunch of people. If you've read through the opening parts of the Old Testament, man, those, those early Israelites were an ungrateful bunch of people. They were always complaining, you know, we were better off in slavery. Moses, where's the water? Where's the food? You know, read it for yourself. <laughs> but down deep, down deep, down deep, you read that and they were longing for vital relationships. And I'm putting the same question to you. Do you want to have vital relationships in your life? And I don't know what your answer is, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this to you. Because I'm a preacher and I'm preaching, right? Y'all got that, right? <laughs> you need vital relationships in your life. You need vital relationships. I do too. We need vital relationships in our life. If you agree with me, say yes. yes. We do. And if you don't have them, why not? That's my push. That's my challenge. Let me help you with this. Let me help us with this. We need to have vital relationships in our life because we struggle against so many things in this life, in this living. We do. And if we don't want to admit it, that means we're not being honest. Is that every single person in this room, we struggle against things like change and transition. We do. We, we, we struggle against it. I, I struggle with it. I've changed the way that I write sermons and do sermons. I changed two years ago. I changed a 20-year habit of writing my sermon on Sunday morning and then going and preaching it. And I changed two years ago when we started doing Wednesday worship and I started writing it on Wednesday and getting up here and preaching it. Last week, this last week, I changed again and wrote it on Thursday and here I am on Sunday preaching it. So let me tell you something as an aside. Don't get all huffy with me about asking you to change church because I'm at the front of the pack leading it. Amen? I know about change. Don't act like I don't. But here's the thing. We need vital relationships to help us deal with that. We need vital, essential, necessary, full of energy relationships to help us deal with transition and change. Because we all have it. We need vital relationships to help us live because so many times we feel like we're out of control. So much information. So many choices. So many things to do. So many temptations. So many harmful habits and addictions that we could find ourselves participating in. We need vital relationships to help keep us from death and dying and meaninglessness. We need them. We need vital relationships all the time, not just when we're in trouble, not just when we're in the emergency room, not just when we've screwed up so bad that nobody will talk to us. We need vital relationships all the time. And let's go a little bit deeper because part of the reality is also this. Every one of us in this room, we need vital, meaningful relationships.